Welcome to the Crack Cast. We are here to discuss the history of the uh, celebration that has taken place in Poland this weekend. Why have we got a centenary, Mike? Well, because it's been a hundred years. Since what, Mike? Since Poland's uh, independence, since it became a country once more after 123 years of non-existence. Ah, the partitions, you say. Let's go back through the sands of time. Okay, so what we're trying to do here is we're trying to take through in a narrative form what happened to Poland, uh, why this is such a big deal, how the country was reformed, and just kind of give our listeners that aren't as familiar with this topic uh, a few fascinating strands of history. Would that be okay, Mike? Yes, it would be. Josh, you are on board I'm this? completely on board with this, yeah. So let's, let's hold hands and go forward. Let's start pre-partition, the Commonwealth, the Lithuanian and Polish duchy. It's, it's functioning along, it's going grand. But things start to go wrong in the mid-17th century. What follows is a hundred years of degeneration, uh, reputation-wise, uh, for the Polish-Lithuanian duchy, where it becomes perceived that the Liberian veto, which uh, basically gives every noble man with a vote a veto, so everything has to be universally approved. So as you can imagine. Consensus sounds fine on paper, but in reality it means that you're basically uh, stalled in any type of uh, political argument. Nothing happens. So true. And what happens is this is used basically in the broader sense. Of course, there's many, many, many reasons. We're not uh, professional historians and we don't have all day. Crucially, we got three partitions to get through. We're not even touching the fourth partition Poland. Don't even go there with us. So, Vienna, 1772, Austria, the Prussians, and the Russians basically decide on a carve up, a Rus- uh, carve up of the territory of the Commonwealth. They come in, they take 30% of that territory pretty easily. You know, there's not any massive resistance or anything. Uh, obviously, a lot of uh, skirmishing, but it seems they, they achieved this goal pretty, pretty hands down. Yeah, at gunpoint, they basically ca- uh, forced the Polish parliament to sign the paperwork to say, like, yeah, this is official, we agree with it. Yeah, and so then we roll on the clock 20 years, uh, things back, uh, you know, there's still a commonwealth, it's just uh, 30% smaller. But all the while, their uh, neighbours are going, well, that was easy. And then we have the uh, 1791 Constitution, the May Constitution. Well, basically, they decided, they're like, oh, let's make a country that's more free and fair and more enlightened and modern. And well, all the uh, imperial forces around say, like, no, we're not going to let you do that. It gives them an excuse to, uh, you know, initiate a new partition and to come in and take over as well one more time. So basically, again, they take a third. Uh, you know, I don't think the uh, the Austrians and the Hungarians were involved this time. It was uh, the, the the Prussians and the Russians did the carving. And uh, on we roll, like, you know, uh, another partition. Ah, yeah. Kosciuszko shows up and says like, hey, I was just, you know, in, in these United States, things went well there. We fought for independence. It's fantastic. Let's try it here in Poland. Uh, yeah, it doesn't go so well. Let's uh, dwell on this man for a little bit, whose name is quite hard to pronounce, Michael. Well, Kosciuszko was very influential in the uh, American Revolution. He was very popular there. He really helped things, you know, move forward. And with those ideals of the Enlightenment era that he picked up there, he decided to uh, transplant that to Poland, hopefully hoping that he'd be able to rebuild his nation, his uh, motherland, his, you know, country of origin. Unfortunately, things really didn't go so well here. Uh, he did start up a revolution here in Krakow. Things started going all right at the beginning, but unfortunately, it didn't really lead to many successes, and it gave the part- uh, partitioning powers an excuse to come in and tear what was left of Poland apart between themselves. And led to what's known as the Great Emigration. Some of uh, the most epic troublemakers of all time left Poland to uh, go and start revolutions all around Europe as well. (laughs) Yes, all the intellectuals, the bourgeoisie, people of influence, the poets, they all left. So you have... Unintended consequences, Germany. Yes, going to France, going to England, even going to Brazil. There's actually a huge uh, Polish population in Brazil that actually ended up, of, of the aristocracy that ended up there during the end of the 18th century. So basically, what all that was about was trying to get us uh, from the 123 years of uh, what's considered, I suppose, the most painful period of of Polish history outside of the 20th century. Would that be fair to say? It's the kind of national scar before, uh, you know, World War II. Would that be 
pretty much, yeah, they consider this their, you know, the crucible they the have to go through. The country was dismembered, yes. you know, and uh, we, we're not even going to, we don't even have time to go into too much detail, but there was uh, uh, policies of Germanization in uh, the west of the country and then Russification in the east of the country. You know, there was a genuine danger of the Polish nation's flame there were political movements initiated by the invading powers to actually rob Poles of their Polishness, yeah, of their nationality. So what we're trying to explain here is that World War War One comes along and upends the uh, geopolitical chessboard of Europe. And uh, Josh, now try and set the scene for us here. World War One ends. Right, and I'm very glad that we're not going to go into too much detail about how World War One came about or what was really involved there, because even to people who know about it, it is extremely complicated, and possibly it's still impossible to be sure exactly what happened and what came it caused it to come about. But anyway, I'm near the end of Christopher Clark's seminal work on that. Uh, yeah, still well, confused. yeah, yeah. Well, I'm sure he is as well. But we come to the um, <laughs> we come to the end of um, we come to the end finally of the First World War. November 1918, and we had a gathering of various of the Allied powers, Britain, France, Russia, and rather late in the day, the United States, led by President Woodrow Wilson, and the idea was to formulate a treaty to settle, because remember, the end of the First World War was actually not an ending as such, it was an armistice, and I think this is, you know, this is something that's not always clearly understood. It was kind of more of a sort of ceasefire by treaty rather than an official we won, you lost kind of scenario. But there was nevertheless this plan to create what was called and is widely known as the Versailles Treaty, which was to make certain deals and agreements and for all parties involved to sign up for those agreements. And onto the world stage strides a man who previously had been celebrated as possibly the most famous piano player of his era, Ignacy Paderewski, born in 1960 in a part of Poland that is no longer part of Poland. Um, he was already world famous as a classical pianist, um, very striking and charismatic individual. Um, and it's probably fair to say that when he kind of he took he he'd been spending a lot of time in the united states he was touring constantly and he came back to poland um because he was a very proud uh polish nationalist and seized the opportunity to basically kind of bend woodrow wilson's ear and say you gotta give us something in you in as part of the versailles treaty we want polish independence we want to be re-established as a nation and it's, I think, you know, it's a fair argument to say that if he had not had that kind of worldwide kind of stature, that uh, Woodrow Wilson and would not necessarily have given him uh, the time, time of, of day. day yeah. um, but anyway, it came to pass before I ramble on too much that one of the fourteen items on the Treaty of Versailles was the establishment, uh, re-establishment of Poland as an independent nation, and following. The signing of the Treaty of Versailles, uh, Paderewski then went on to become the first Prime Minister of the Second Republic, a position actually which he only held for about 10 months because it turned out that uh, uh, the political landscape was a little less adulatory than the, the uh, concert piano tour circuit. Um, but he did his part and a very significant part. And uh, I think it's fair to say that in the bigger picture of Polish history, Paderewski is one of those giant figures, love him or hate him, but his his position is assured. And enter stage left, a man named Josef Pilsudski gets sent back by the Germans because of the uh, armistice. They uh, basically release him and uh, off he trots back to uh, Poland. Michael, at this stage, I'd like you to introduce uh, both Domowski and Pilsudski to the story. Ooh, we need to go back a little bit here. Piłsudski was the uh, leader of the Polish Socialist Party at the time. Uh, as a young man, he was involved in a lot of underground movements, uh, a, a lot of you know pamphlets and papers being drawn up. Didn't he pull off a famous heist of oh, the yes, Warsaw tax take? Uh, sounds like a hell of a job. Basically, yeah, he was 
they're definitely gun happy. He was one of those political leaders who was interested in top five mustaches of all time. Oh, Just oh yeah, it's those handlebars to die for. Uh, but he was definitely he definitely wanted Poland's independence, and he was ready to fight for it for decades beforehand. Any opportunity, he even went off to Japan and said, like, "Hey, will you guys give us some guns? You know, you know, we'll shoot at Russians. You guys are at war with Russia." Well, we're going to be on the same side here. Uh, and he f- wanted to fight for Poland's independence. When World War One broke out, which he said was going to happen anyway, he originally sided with the Germans and the Austrians, but that was mainly because he thought the Russians were weaker. But he also knew that the Germans and Austrians, or he believed, would also lose. His idea was to first beat down the Russians, and as soon as the Germans become weak, uh, to break away from them and become my own thing. And that's kind of how he played it off. Uh, so when the Russians were weaker, the Germans realized that he wasn't going to support them. He actually told all his, uh, officers to not pledge allegiance to the Germans. Uh, so the Germans arrested him, but after a while they realized this would be problematic and they released him right at the end of the war. He's on that train to Warsaw. He shows up in Warsaw on November 11th, says, okay, we got Poland now. Let's get things started. And this is where the uh, divergence between his vision for uh, what Poland would be and, say, uh, Domofsky's party uh, would uh, think it should look like. Whereas Domofsky wanted a smaller, uh, Polish-led, mostly Polish uh, ethnic homogenous nation that was smaller. Uh, Pilsudski was thinking big and he wanted uh, parts of the Ukraine. He wanted uh, Galicia. He wanted to expand east. He wanted to to rebuild the Commonwealth as it was, as a multi-ethnic mixed state. While Domofsky... Agrarian socialism, would you you say? Something along those lines. He was definitely a socialist, but he was more of a pragmatic socialist. He knew the uh, concepts of socialists were popular at the time and it was a great way to get support to get things rolling. Domofsky, for instance, he was a political leader in more of the right-wing nationalist parties. Anti-Semite uh, soil. Uh, Anti-Semite, but not in the same definition of anti-Semite. Now, but let's not even go in that hey, direction. It was because, the 20s. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but it may, on, the thing is, Piłsudski was all gone happy before that to uh, get Polish independence. While Domofsky always said, like, the best way to get Polish independence is through diplomacy and through talking. And, he was, you know, a lot of people in the West really liked him when he would come around, give lectures and like, hey, we like this guy. You know, he makes sense. He was, you know, a lot more open, like more peaceful ways to approach the, uh, the formation of an independent Poland. And when that actually happened, he formed his own government. And there was a point where this actually where Paderewski stepped in, where uh, the West wasn't sure should they recognize Piłsudski, should they recognize Domowski, who's who's actually in charge of this new country that is apparently showing up here. Paderewski helped bring Domowski and Piłsudski together to actually form a new nation. Domowski's concept of forming Poland was, though, that it should be a country based around a nation in the sense of an ethnic group, that there will be Poland for Poles, Ukraine for Ukrainians, uh, Lithuania for Lithuanians, Czechs for, uh, for the Czechs, etc., 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 while Piłsudski wanted to bring all these nations together to form a new state that would be kind of a balance between the Western German uh, Empire and the uh, Eastern, uh, well, now it was the Soviet Empire, but before then it would have been the Russian Empire. I would say it's uh, fair to say uh, Domovsky is not as well loved uh, by by Polish people. Would that be? Yes, but you I mean, know, he's a giant figure in Polish he's history. He's a huge figure. He was definitely loved his country. He was a patriot. He was raised, but he thought of Poland as being a nation for Poles, especially Catholic Poles. Yeah, uh, he had nothing against the other nations. He just thought like, well, we're not going to create a nation that's of mixed groups. We need to create nations for each one of these groups, and we'll figure out the borders more or less depending on in a given area who's the majority, and then you know the gray areas will figure out through trees and stuff, stuff like that. Uh, he's known for saying a lot of anti-Semitic things, but generally he didn't think of uh, Jews as being a, of a lesser group. He just thought of them as another political group that were not Polish, in the sense like Ukrainians were another political group that were not Polish. Germans were another political group that were not Polish. He just thought of like, well, everybody deserves their own. And and he was with Paderewski uh, at Versailles when uh, the treaty was signed. Right, yes, yeah. 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 So that's that's uh, important to note as well. But uh, it seems that uh, Pilsudski kind of uh, ends up being the, the 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 main charismatic figurehead in the government. Well, Pilsudski, and, because of his military involvement, yeah. Bef- uh, well, that's bef- what I was just going to say. The war starts straight away, nearly with Ukraine. Uh, you know, the Polish-Ukraine uh, border war becomes pretty uh, pretty intense pretty quickly. And uh, so it's the vision for Pilsudski's p- version of Poland that uh, begins to be implemented, and then. The Russians start marching into Poland. 
Well, Bolshevik. not the Russians there anymore. They were the Bolsheviks, the, the Soviets. Yeah, Bolshevik, so. Russia is on the march. What it is looking at is the Red Army, which have crushed the whites, even though they had uh, financial support uh, secretly. At by whites, we're talking about Winston the political Churchill. concepts, not the... Uh, yes, yes, of course. People know. Nowadays, yeah. you never know. <laughs> the Mensheviks, as they were known. Uh, but anyway, the uh, that war... Is huge. I mean, look, come on. This is this is the absolute one of the absolute most under talked about pivot points in all of human history. The Red Army looks across and it sees Germany in chaos, and all it sees. And Lenin gave many speeches that said exactly this. He said, "All we have to do is march to Berlin through Warsaw and start a socialist communist revolution." And who's to say if they'd have made it to Berlin, that's not exactly what would have happened. I mean, do you agree, Mike, or am I, am I being point a hyperbolic? hyperbolic? Uh, no, you're not being, you're not exaggerating at all. Lenin and the Bolsheviks basically believed in this international concept of communism, of the socialist revolution, that it's going to happen can't everywhere. Be I mean, they, uh, they, they yeah. pursued that relentlessly, you know. And they assumed that they're just going to go through Poland. You know, there'll be a little skirmishes here and there. We're just going to go get to Germany. Germany was there, basically their target. The country was in shambles. It was falling apart. And communist and socialist parties were gaining power. They were gaining influence. They thought they would just show up there with their forces and boom, we're ready to go. But along the way, they just have to go through Poland. You just have to go through Piłsudski, which, you know, oddly enough, the guy considered himself a socialist earlier along, but he was not at all interested in the international concept of socialism. Or in, he always said, like, socialism for him was just an ends to the means, uh, a means to the end. The, the end being the independence of Poland. As, as, long, as soon as Poland was independent, he didn't really care about socialism anymore. He wanted an independent country. And the concept of socialism that the Bolsheviks were spreading had nothing to do with independent nation states anymore. Authoritarianism yeah. and uh, pure state vandalism is all it is. But this leads uh, the scene. I think we set the scene nicely now for the greatest episode in Polish history, which is why I think we, we've nicely gotten around to the reason why this is so important this holiday. Because the Polish-Soviet war is a very, as we said, it's not as famous as it should be worldwide, but, uh, you know, it's an incredible victory. Uh, just, you know, Mike, you must have been so proud reading about this as a, as a 15 year old, you know, I bet you, bet you were like crying all over your history books. Maybe not like that, but yes, <laughs> <laughs> I was crying because I could barely understand the language at the time and I didn't give a rat's ass about European history. No, but the truth is on paper, it's like Poland had no chance to win. You know, this a country that just barely been formed with all these different political groups with different interests fighting against them, amongst each themselves. And all of a sudden they have this force coming from the east that a lot of the local uh parties were actually, you know, favoring, but somehow they were able to get their, they get their shit together, quite honestly, and ward off this wave of evil that was coming in from the East. And for some reason, you know, the rest of Europe doesn't really ever talk about, doesn't, doesn't realize how everything would have changed if the miracle on the Viswa had not occurred. If and I think, actually, just to interrupt here, but I think that this must surely color a lot of Polish people's perception of how um, the Western Allies... Uh, treated Poland at the very beginning of the Second World War because it wasn't just the treaties about, OK, if Germany invades, we will stand up and fight on your behalf. It wasn't just a kind of because that's a decent thing to do, but actually Poland felt legitimately as a consequence of this that it had protected the whole of Europe from... The the red wave coming from the east. That's like, hey, you guys owe us. What the hell? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I can get I get that, yeah. It's one of the most astonishing uh, military victories of all time. And uh, interestingly, uh, I was doing a little bit of reading about it uh, before today, and it is considered by military historians to be one of the greatest, uh, you know, you know, there's this massive cottage industry of military nerds, like, you know, ranking battles and, you know, comparing tactics and history, some interesting stuff. And there's no doubt about it. Like, I mean, the, the final the final casualties, uh, I have them here, they're, uh, they're astonishing. Like, you know, basically, I, I don't want to get too into the weeds on describing the battle because I think we'll do a bad job of it. That's why you need a, you know, a real historian. But I think uh, it's fair to say that, you know, the plan was to take Warsaw and the, the, the Pilsudski's men um, had an orderly retreat and then a pretty vicious counterattack at the Vistula. You know, Mike, have you any more, any more detail on the, the miracle on the, the Vistula? Well, basically, all I can say is the miracle was a miracle because of the fact that, like, on paper, they were limited in the amount of forces. The Russians, the Soviets were moving ahead. Nothing 
seem to be able to support the Poles, but somehow they're able to fight back. And a lot of credit is given to Pusutsky and his men for well, basically putting up a wall against the, the Reds and then pushing them back to Russia, to, to the Soviet Empire, the way they had promised to the West that they would. Uh, here are the final figures. On the Polish side, 4,500 dead, 22,000 wounded, 10,000 missing, total 36,500. On the Russian side... 10 to 25,000 dead, 30,000 wounded, 65 to 66,000 captured, 30 to 35,000 interned in eastern Prussia, total 110 to wow. 26,000. <laughs> that sounds pretty comprehensive to me. So Russia's taken care of, the uh, Treaty of Riga is signed, the borders are established, and uh, Poland is, once again, after 123 years in the wilderness, a proper state with defined borders, Mike. Somewhat our, defined, yes, but unfortunately now without having something for everybody to unify against, Poland now has to uh, start figuring how to, you know, move on forward. And unfortunately, politics begins. Oh, <laughs> you love politics. Now, nobody does a detailed breakdown of the uh, political scene like you, Mike. So let's let's set the scene here domestically. The war has calmed down. Of course, uh, Pilsudski's the great hero of the day. What happens next? Thank you for not putting me on the spot like that. <laughs> No, but the truth is, it's very complicated. Be, uh, for the decades leading up to this point, there have been many groups of people with different views on how to gain Polish independence. Uh, and once Poland would gain independence, what this new nation, new country would look like. All of a sudden, you have Poland here, and none of them can play nice. Uh, there are different concepts about how to build this new nation, how it should be run, uh, how the constitution would look like. Piłsudski is basically... People let him... Uh, run the show just because of his charisma, just because of his personal authority, and that actually helps stabilize things. Uh, we get to the point where we do have a parliamentary democracy, which Bosutsky wasn't a huge fan of, but he, you know, he he let it run its course. Uh, the f- and uh, there was actually talk about him being the president of Poland, but he didn't want to take part in the elections mainly because as president he would have had very limited powers. He didn't like the, that idea. And the first president of Poland was Gabriel Narutowicz. Uh, a colleague, a friend of Piłsudski. So just when the elections uh, came through, Piłsudski gives up his powers authority to Narutowicz. You know, I think it takes, what, five days or something like that before Narutowicz gets shot and assassinated. <laughs> Oops. Uh, Piłsudski... We shouldn't laugh. The man got shot. Come on. Like... Yeah, but like, you know, it's like... it's. Uh... What's the real on that? A hundred years? It's too soon? Okay. All right. yeah, that's more or less. You know, uh, this guy probably wasn't expecting it. He was an engineer. He built dams. People who get shot rarely do. Uh... <laughs> Yeah, uh, okay, sorry, so keep going, keep going, sorry. Uh, so Narutowicz gets shot, the political situation in Poland becomes very fragile, but a lot of people show up to the funeral, mm-hmm. hundreds of thousands. So the extremists, the right-wingers who had you know, taken care of Narutowicz realize they don't really have much political backing, and this allows Piłsudski to gain influence one more time and for the uh, political stage to be more or less stabilized. And now Poland comes into a situation where it's a parliamentary democracy. We're moving forward. Piłsudski is in charge, but things aren't all that stable. They're, they're kind of moving forward, but you know, there's a lot of bickering. The parties aren't playing nice. You have the right t- trying to take advantage of the situation. You have the left trying to take advantage of the situation. You have a newly born country that needs to be led and rebuild but there's nothing but internal bickering going on, which is... And then we move from politics to economics, and from there we shall go to social policy. But to stay on economics for a little bit, it it, it commonly gets thrown around. It was an agrarian, backwards society (laughs) with the same faults that you saw in the Ukraine. and But that wasn't strictly true, was it? It was was technically a kind of a middle ground between Germany. It had the rich uh, slant regions. It had a lot of industry. It was not uh, as well advanced as, as some countries, but... It was a, uh, all you can do is really compare. And, you know, it was actually a, a fairly decent, thriving place. The state wasn't, you know, there was no starvation. There wasn't like any huge uh, upheaval. Would it be fair to say that possibly the living standards, etc., cetera, um, get dumbed down a bit, in, you know, and say in the popular version? When you realize the fact that Poland also became a country that was a bunch of different partitions put together, each one of them with different legal structures. Yeah, they kind of did okay. It it did very well. It's like you're trying to put all these generally different regions that have been under different powers for, for a century and a half 
you have to stick it together to create one nation when even the train lines didn't match. Mm. Uh, yeah. it, it was a miracle that things went in as well as they did. And this country actually was uh, uh, prospering, you know, maybe not prospering, was it? But actually, there was a lot of potential being shown. But unfortunately, politics kept getting in the way. People were not able to unify. Uh, and even though there wasn't that much outside influence from the Soviets or for the Germans at the time, because they had their own problems to worry about, Poles just couldn't unify. Things were disorderly. Uh, you didn't have a government and, lasting and more than a couple of months. And let's dwell on that for a second. You know, you've got Nazi Germany starting to form. Uh, the the embers of uh, you know the depression are, are coming in the thirties. You know, yeah, that all help. of that is in the future. All of that is in the future. But you know, there's no good things happening in Germany post World War One. You know, ferments are fermenting, and uh, in Russia. I mean, come on, you must be looking at that going, that's going to get nasty again. You know, I mean, it must have been an intimidating geopolitical situation for Poland, who, and all Poles at this stage, must have been painfully aware of their geographical place in the world and how uh, unfortunate yeah, The screen it door of Europe getting slammed as one country went past. Uh, but yes, Piłsudski in 1926, when there was another government being formed that just wasn't working, Stepped out of retirement, like Michael Jordan said, like, yeah, I'm going to take care of this now. Uh, and That's a very gentle way of describing a, uh, a coup. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, it, Jordan <laughs> steps on the court. He'd be paid to do it by his employers. You know, I don't think he'd just walk onto some random... What thing. kind of shoes it was, was he wearing? It was almost a bloodless coup, except for the couple hundred people that were killed. But no, <laughs> actually, when it happened, nobody really expected it to be that violent. But it was limited to a few hundred deaths uh, because the Polish government at the time didn't want quite a few deaths <laughs> considering uh, like revolutions and wars where thousands tens of thousands where people uh, people were killed uh, Piłsudski generally had public support from all sides of the sides of the political spectrum because he promised stability and when he finally did take over uh, in 26 stability is what we had um, he's this huge personality, you know, isn't he? Like he's, yes. he, you can't really pin him down. He's a, he's authoritarian. <laughs> he's authoritarian <laughs> or that, or without being too much of an asshole, but still he was, yeah. It, he's a socialist. He's an agrarianist. He, he is has, that a word? No. What's going wrong all of a he sudden? He has magnificent also. moustaches. Yeah. Yes. I mean, Piłsudski is an example of why we really can't use the left right divide so simply because it just doesn't work that way in the real world. But I think, you know, true to the chaos that we've described, we, 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 we've shown why he's, you know, a compelling figure. Everyone can kind of get along with this idea that, okay, a couple of hundred dead in a coup, that's not ideal, Mike. But, you know, he's such an iconic figure. Would you say, to, would you say how is his reputation today? I'm very curious about this. How, how modern, say, politically engaged uh, people view Pilsudski. Is there any left-right divide there, or is he seen universally as, oh, Pilsudski? It's very hard to pin him down, just like you're saying. Uh, he's by the left. He's not really considered a socialist hero or anything along those lines. Nobody of, of any communist background will say, like, oh, this was our guy. Uh, right-wingers don't love him either, but generally he's ex uh, uh, ex uh, accepted as a father figure, a statesman at the time that like helped put things together. Uh, so what happens after the coup? I mean, uh, are there are there any? Um, let's just clear this up because of the couple of hundred deaths. I'm sure our listeners not as familiar with Polish history are are wondering. There's no real further bloodbaths on Pilsudski's watch. There's not. It's not. You know. You were well, not into. I'm sure there. You know. There might be. <laughs> but, you know, there was specifically ordered by the government. Like, no, there was no like we're dragging them out in the middle of the night and shooting people in the face, kind of Soviet style things. Nothing like that happening. But Pilsudski later on, there was a situation where he started arresting political opposition and sending them to this one uh, jail. I knew there'd be something. Uh, <laughs> though it sounds horrible by our, our standards, back in the day, this was quite mild. And we're not talking about no, tens it's of thousands. To make that yeah. point. You know, uh, it is. We always have to look at history and remember how the frame it compared to how it was back then. Uh, he didn't have any of these like, strong totalitarian like uh, instincts to hammer down on his opposition. It's just like if somebody really wasn't you know, helping the situation, he would like, arrest them, put, you know, get rid of them for a while, and you know, if they played nice, he would let them come back to the scene. Uh, this wasn't like the Soviets or the Russians that would send people off to Siberia or the Nazis that would actually you know, shoot people. It was just like, okay, you're not really playing along nice. Well, we'll, we'll arrest you for six months. 
So we've done our best to uh, illustrate why Pilsudski uh, occupies such a formidable place in the Polish psyche. We can do no more than lay it out all on the table for you. I think you'll you'll get by listening to this uh, that he is, if nothing else, Mike, would you agree? Just a fascinating character. That's true. I mean, he's somebody who definitely deserves his place in history books and uh, brings up a lot of emotions in people, no matter what size of the political spect- spectrum they're on. Although it amazes me to when you read all the personal accounts, he's by all accounts a very dour man, like zero crack altogether of him. <laughs> <laughs> he doesn't look like much fun. Like I think that has to be not what as well. I'm not sure I want to go drinking with Paul That's the funny Pilsudski. thing. He was known as a loner. He's he Paderewski to break out a few tunes at the end of the night. You know? Yeah, he was known as a loner, but there were so many people that were completely loyal to him that had worked with him or served with him earlier in his career in his military career. You know. He must uh, they have had loved something. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, I get what you're saying. I get what you're saying. So now we were faced with a sticky choice. Where to go from 1926, Mike? I think we can agree that uh, we've already mentioned, you know, the growing power of uh, Soviet Russia. Uh, and in the next few years, some disturbing things start to happen um, in the rest of Europe. How would you describe 1926 to 1939 in a few minutes? Because uh, I don't really want to get into the weeds on this because, uh, you know, we could be here all day. Chaotic, but stable, even though that sounds like a contradiction right there. Uh, with Pusutsky more or less in charge, he kept the country going. Uh, and the political scene there being messed up as it was, he was the guiding voice. You had your parliaments choosing their new members of state, elections every once in a while, new presidents, which really didn't have that much power, but things chugged along. Uh, and the country, you know, more or less prospered or as much as it could have in that time. Uh, and by 1935, they actually had decided on a new constitution and a new, a new set of laws that would have kind of switched over the country from a more of a less of a parliamentary democracy to more of a presidential style democracy where the head of state would actually have uh, the executive powers, more like in the U.S. or something like that. And that's and it was basically b- written with Pusutsky in mind. It was prepared for him to be the guy in charge. And then, you know, he goes and dies, which kind of messes things up. A little inconvenient. Yeah, so it kind of screws everybody's plans. And then we go back to, you know, things being Italian. So it's just, you know, one government after another, politicians arguing, and, you know, next four years is pretty much just that. I think it's important to note as well that uh, Poland... I wouldn't say through any massive fault of its own, just because of the wars it's fought and the situation it's been in, uh, carving out its own existence, doesn't have many allies in Europe, which is a problem. You know, uh, they only really have France. France and Poland have always had this uh, strange historical kind of connection. Um, well, because they never shared a border. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, that'll be it. Yeah. That's a good point, Mike. <laughs> Yeah, amnesty never had the chance to grow. Is that what you're saying? <laughs> I believe so, yeah. But, you know, yeah, Poland had Germany on one side, which, you know, for obvious reasons had issues with them, with the Soviets, Russians on the other side. And even, like, the Czechs, which everybody thinks, you know, Poles and Czechs love each other. No, back then they also had some issues when it came to the borders. With the Lithuanians, with the Ukrainians. They, the, che- the Czechs cozied up to the Russians and uh, yeah. the Poles were... Uh, I've always been steadfast in their hatred of Russia. <laughs> You got to give them credit there. Consistency so many, is an admirable. You had so yeah, many parties, trait. groups, and countries here. One is friends with the other, which means the other can't be friends with them. It, it's like high school all over again, just with wars and armies. So then uh, Hitler happens, and uh, you all know about what happens next, really, don't you? I mean, do we have to? Do, do you think that there's a danger that we'll cheapen our journey through history by attempting to cover the rise of Nazi Germany in a in a couple of minutes, Mike? Do you, uh, is this going to be like Godwin's Law now? Like we mentioned Hitler, so the conversation is over. Okay, well now I'm not arguing about. It. We we naturally got to him, like you know, <laughs> he, he just, is a he just he came a part of power. history. Yes. <laughs> okay, I have a suggestion here: is that we because kind of everybody knows more or less about this bit. Let's just kind of reintroduce a figure from. Earlier on, Ignacy Paderewski, ah, who disappeared, who disappeared from the political stage pretty rapidly after he'd done his bit for establishing the Second Republic, went back to being the Maradona of the uh, concert piano circuit. He was that good. He really was. I mean, he the was the Maradona of the concert circuit. I like. If you like, if you wanted to pick a name that was synonymous with being a genius piano player, rather as you would apply the same with Maradona. He was to, that guy. What, what, You'd say, hey, you're a bit of a Paderewski if you sat at the piano, like, knocking out a few little boogie-woogie tunes. <laughs> um, 
<laughs> Boogie Woogie. Yeah. The forgotten genre. So, um, for a reason. <laughs> he'd resumed his wildly successful kind of concert career. And he was now, of course, a very old man, but um, he remained at heart a, a, a fervent Polish nationalist. And once all this, uh, shall we say, shit came down in 1939, he once again attempted to um, do his bit in getting involved in establishing the Polish government in exile, mm -hmm. of course, was in London. Um, he didn't do very, very much in that because he died in 1941. But nevertheless... Asshole. Uh, another inconsiderate move by another great Polish statesman. Um, but I think that probably, you know, takes us up to the point where... Um, before we get up to 1989, there was, you know, the post-war kind of Poland, which was essentially a kind of a Soviet satellite republic. And you had the kind of quasi-Polish government, which was based in London. And uh, that was the foundation of that. Well, nobody, well, nobody ever remembers, actually, that the Polish president exile actually gave the symbol of nationhood to Wałęsa. Yes. Uh, when he won the uh, election, kind of connecting... The third Beautiful Republic of Poland. Obama. I really, yeah, I thought that was very, very touching. Actually, I thought that really, uh, you know, kind of. There and was, he there also was died in Smolensk on the plane crash. Um, yeah. There was a point I wanted to make, actually, that we, we probably should have noted, is that um, Poland didn't sleepwalk uh, towards Nazi Germany's fist. They spent up to, I believe, 30% of the national budget on the military. They were, had a quite a large military. Let's be clear on this. Nazi Germany rolled over all of the world's military until we managed to beat them back after seven years. Uh, you know, it was crazy what Poland faced. You know, uh, the Luftwaffe, I believe, had 23,000 air aircraft ready to go when they, invaded, when they invaded Poland. It was not a fair fight. If it had been a war, you know, Poland would have had a good chance. They had doughty fighters. They had a brilliant uh, national aviation uh, carrier that produced uh, all of the world's best fighter planes, but they weren't producing them in the quantities that Messerschmitts were going out. And unfortunately, they had to sell the airplanes, you know, to, to make enough money to pay for the roads. And, uh, you know, it was, it was a was a country that was barely, you know, back in existence and, you know, and all of a sudden it has to prepare for war. And nobody ever remembers the fact that... they that, tried. That was the you point. Know, Poland you know, Poland lasted for six weeks when the Germans were expecting Poland to fall in two or three yeah. weeks, and uh, they saw it coming. Like they saw, it, like I think it's very just important to note that you know, uh, for all the failings of the the Second Republic, they they saw the rise of Nazi Germany coming. They, they knew what was coming, you know, and they and they did do their best to to be prepared. It didn't catch them by surprise, it, you know. I mean, it, it was unfortunate that you know when they, the actual invasion was the, in the middle of a, a massive ramp up. You know, they might have had a better chance to. Uh, well, let's be honest, it would have probably still went to. Uh, the unfortunate way that it did. So I'd like to wrap up by concluding with you, Mike. Have we covered about why the Second Republic is so important to Polish people? Do you think we've, we've, we've grasped the nettle here? Is there anything you'd like to add about why the, the centenary is so important? No, I think we've touched on the uh, major issues and we've, I hope that a lot of people out there understand why it's so complicated and, you know, why it matters to Poles. Josh? Concluding thought? I know you really hate it when I say I have nothing further to add on that, so I'm going to have to add something. And I think, okay, I'll say this. It is very complicated because it's 100 years of independence, which rather unfortunately was interrupted by another 40-odd years of not quite so independence. And that's why it's important to, you know, because it's like, yeah, the, the, the history of Poland in the last 300 years is like all these horrific interruptions and uh, wars and separations and partitions and, uh, you know, conquests. And I think, I think sometimes uh, maybe the point of this piece was if, if you're, you know, a casual visitor to Poland and you say, well, what's the centenary of, you know, like... What is it? I hope we've we've kind of uh, illustrated that. You know, maybe to all foreigners out there who really don't understand the politics or the decisiveness of what's going on right now, maybe they just should think of the 11th of November as Hug a Pole Day. <laughs> <laughs> enjoy the uh, enjoy the day off, Poland. I know I will. 